We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until Holly Hughes is a performance artist, although she is not sure what performance art is. Nevertheless, there is some reason to believe she might be one. Whatever it is she does, she started doing it in New York City during the twilight of the Carter administration. In the early 1980s, she became a member of the WOW Cafe, a feminist collective made up of people who had been run out of other feminist collectives. Her work has focused on issues of sexuality, identity, personal narrative, and freedom of expression. Some of her performances include The Well of Horniness, The Lady Dick, Dress Suits to Hire, World Without End, Preaching to the Perverted, Turkey the New Musical, and After a Fashion. In 1996, Grove Press collected five of her early pieces in Clit Notes, a sapphic sampler. She has performed or had her work produced across the United States Canada and Great Britain at venues ranging from cultural institutions such as the Hammer Museum, the Walker Art Center, and the Guggenheim Museum to alternative spaces such as Performance Space 122, a home base for urban cultural expression in New York City. Her work has also been performed or produced at numerous universities and community-based arts organizations. Holly Hughes has been awarded funding from sources including the National Endowment for the Arts, the Ford Foundation, and the Rockefeller Foundation. She's currently teaching at the University of Michigan with a joint appointment in the School of Art and Design and the Department of Theater and Drama. Welcome, Holly. Thank you. Mimi, I can call you Mimi? Yes, you can okay. call me Mimi. Um, just to give you a sense of the flow, um, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions about your work and life, and then at the end we'll open it to questions from the audience. So. Sounds fabulous. Awesome. Um, so I guess I'd like you to sort of start at the beginning. Can you just tell me a little bit about where you were born? Um, actually, <laughs> does, this, does this mean any, I'll test how much of a Michigander you are by holding <laughs> this up and asking you if this means anything to it you. It does, it does. It does. This is what we do in Michigan is that we, uh, when you ask the question of where you're from, we hold up the hand. There's another part of Michigan, but we don't discuss it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and really, this isn't the most accurate map of Michigan. Um, I mean, I'd have to saw my thumb off and, like, you know, glue it on here. But we're not going to do that today. <laughs> I'm going to save that for radio. Um, uh, and uh, I'm actually here um, uh, from Saginaw, which is also the Navy bean capital of the world, but I'm sure I don't have to tell you that. Oh. Uh, but that's where I was reared. Um, oh. <laughs> And I uh, went to school in Michigan. I went to Kalamazoo College, which is a small liberal arts college in the western part of the state, using the word liberal in the loosest sense of the word, <laughs> in, in a more academic than political sense of the word. And um, I attempted to escape Michigan by moving to um, New York in the late 70s, um, uh, I was going to be part of this, this um, I don't know, this feminist organization. I don't know if you remember this. Feminism was kind of a 70s thing, you know, <laughs> like kind of like when Quiche was a health food and John Travolta <laughs> made his first appearance. So anyways, I, Quiche has come back and so has John Travolta, but not feminism. <laughs> Go figure. And I've come back to Michigan. Um, full circle. Uh, full I was hoping for a different shape. <laughs> I don't think circle is really my shape, but yes. Um, so I spent 20 years in New York City doing, I'm not really sure what, but we can talk about that later. Sure. Um, to go back to the early years. Of oh, the, the early years, yes. <laughs> the um, wonder years. <laughs> <laughs> so in the wonder years, um, what was your relationship with your family like? <laughs> <laughs> My relationship with my family was um, 
hideous in a very typically um, uh, American middle class white um, way. Um, we were sort of four slices of American cheese individually wrapped in our own private sorrow inhabiting the same, you know, faux colonial. Um, uh, we were, we were, every once in a while my mother would ask these questions of like, why can't we act like a family? And I thought that was so, that was so descriptive. Why can't we act like one? Because clearly we're not. <laughs> clearly we have no relationship to each other. We have no idea how we arrived at this. Um, my parents were middle class, um, Republican, golf playing, um, depressed people um, living in in Michigan and um, I had a complicated relationship with them which I'm trying to like I've parlayed into a career since then <laughs> uh, and um, it's my relationship with has improved a little bit since their death but um, not as much as one would hope <laughs> Um, so there are four of you. You have one sibling, though? Um, yeah, as far as I know. <laughs> but perhaps somebody in the studio audience will want to address that issue later. <laughs> yes, I have, I have a sister, and where is she today, since we're in Ann Arbor, and my sister lives in Ann Arbor. Oh. But that says something about my relationship with my family, doesn't it? Too? Yes, definitely. Um, when did you leave home? Uh, when did I leave home? Uh, that's, I left home uh, to go to college, but I, you know, I didn't have like, I couldn't really get out of this, you know. Um, but Kalamazoo felt, uh, it felt like an escape from Saginaw, even though it was not the navy bean capital, it was the celery capital of the free world. Um, at, when I was 18, I went to college, and then uh, when I was 23, I moved to New York City. What made you move to New York? Um, a plane. Um, I, I, you know, I came, I was in the process of coming out as a lesbian. Um, mm -hmm. I was actually, that's what I did in college. I was in the process of coming out as a lesbian and then I'd go back in as a born again Christian. And there was a kind of, there was something, there, there, there's something related between the born again Christian thing and the lesbian thing in the 70s. I mean, we wore plaid shirts and both things. We, <laughs> lots of guitar songs, lots of sitting around in circles. In one circle, you talked about brotherhood, and the other one, you talked about sisterhood. There was a lot of passive aggressiveness, um, sort of disguised as uh, political action. Um, but so I sort of did this back and forth between um, coming out as a lesbian in college, um, which was kind of in Kalamazoo in the 70s was sort of the sound of one hand clapping, really. I mean, there was yes. no one to really, there's that one hand right now out there in the <laughs> audience. It's still clapping. Um, so, um, you know, I, I try to. Um, come out as a lesbian and then I'd give give up and go back to Jesus and um, after a while he wasn't speaking to me anymore either <laughs> actually he it was the 70s and he had moved to the Sun Belt like a lot of people in the Midwest it was a very grim time and I, I realized that if I was actually going to have sex with another woman that I had to leave the state or at least that part of the state and um, I saw a nice little pink brochure for the New York Feminist Art Institute. So filled with all this, um, this sort of sisterly visions of all the sort of non-hierarchical, uh, anti-colonial work we were going to make in collaboration. I had these visions of like giant soft sculpture vaginas that we would kind of collectively erect, if I may. Um, <laughs> In, in, in Times Square and how that would topple the military industrial complex. And it was a time of naming yourself after condiments that you would find in, in your um, spice cabinet and um, feeling like that was really striking a blow against the patriarchy. So I came to New York to be part of this feminist collective and um, it was very excited about it. And I got there and none of the women in the collective were speaking to each other. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> sisterhood may be beautiful, but it was also kind of nasty at that point. Um, but it got me um, out of Michigan, gave me a really interesting, diverse group of women, and it introduced me to a new way of thinking about making art and a connection between my political concerns as a feminist um, and as an aspiring lesbian um, and, and, and my artistic goals um, through consciousness raising, which was what we did back in the 70s when we learned not even key shore watching John Travolta and trying <laughs> to reimagine him as a lesbian. <laughs> Um, you talked a little bit about coming out. Um, uh -huh. I was going to ask you a little bit about relationships through your life. Um, I, when did that start for you, or what have been some of the mo more important ones? Um, I think that uh, my relationships, um, I discovered that I was a, a, a lesbian in, in the typical way of falling in love in, in a typical sort of pre-lesbian phase in college and that I didn't know if I wanted to be this woman or um, have her. And, um, uh, and, and I would sort of, I, I think the expression was stalking would be uh, possibly uh, <laughs> a polite and probably accurate term for the kind of relationship that we had. Um, and I came out in the context of lesbian feminism, um, which was a real break from the way that lesbianism was presented um, in, in America or experienced in America up to that point. Um, there was a huge influx of middle class white women into uh, the lesbian world, and there was a sort of disavowal of some earlier, um, some of the earlier uh, cultural expression. Doesn't that sound good? Cultural expression. Um, that that means like ways we dressed up and flirted with each other. Cultural <laughs> expression. Um, there was there was a break uh, with that um, with the birth of lesbian feminism, and. There were wonderful things about that moment. There, were all, there was also um, a way in which it, there was also a moment in feminism when there's a whole sort of critique of sexuality and gender, which played out um, in my personal life as, this, as a time where it felt like every sort of type of sex and um, gender presentation was suspect. There was no gender like no gender. Um, you know, uh, sex was really something that we were going to possibly get rid of when the matriarchy arrived. Um, it was, I mean, I think about what else was happening in America in the 70s, and it was this, this wild time, but it wasn't really wild um, uh, in the lesbian fem. I know there's lesbian feminists who had um, they can do their own show with you. Um, they had fabulous sex, fine. I'm happy for them, but I was not one of them. Um, I just had this image of uh, coming out because I had this erotic pull towards women and then finding that all the lesbians had stopped having sex. Or <laughs> it seemed like when they talk about sex, it would seem like two salmon lying side by side, kind of wiggling in a dry stream bread. And I was just like, <laughs> so it took, I was, a, I was a slow starter. <laughs> and I had no lesbian skills. I didn't know that you needed skills to be a lesbian. Um, uh, but, um, you know, I, I, I couldn't throw, I can't catch, sports involving <laughs> balls frighten me. Uh, I'm not a vegetarian, I eat meat. I, I think all I eat is meat. Um, uh, but I did have a cat. Um, <laughs> that was what I had going for me. That was my one lesbian skill. And so it took me a while to have relationships other than in, in um, the privacy of my own mind. Um, <laughs> to admit that actually I was attracted to really masculine women exclusively, women that were supposed to have gone, um, gone the way of the dodo bird with the, the advent of lesbian feminism, women who were described as butch. And 
So I felt this like double shaming of my sexuality, even as I struggled to understand it as a lesbian, this other sort of like, you know, I'm drawn to this thing that's, you know, and I'm bad feminist, bad feminist, bad <laughs> feminist. I was just hitting myself with the state of Michigan. Did you notice that? <laughs> it's getting layered in here, isn't it? <laughs> Definitely. Um, so when you got to New York, um, yeah. how did you, can you tell us a little bit about what the WOW Cafe is or how you got involved in it? I, um, there was this period between when this, the sisterhood of the New York Feminist Art Institute totally collapsed. I mean, it wasn't just silence, it just like collapsed. And a period between when I um, found the WOW Cafe that was, I just felt like, I, I felt like a waitress without a cause. Why had I moved to New York City to live in an even crummier apartment? Um, uh, and do the same things that I was doing in Kalamazoo. Um, and then one day I saw this poster called Double X, that said Double X Rated Christmas Party for Women. And I was like, I am so there. <laughs> <laughs> I am there before the doors open and the doors are not the only thing that open. Um, and I walk inside and it's in the basement of the Catholic Church. It's a different moment in Catholicism. <laughs> Um, and I walk inside and there's like racks of, um, of thrift store clothes, tuxedos, prom dresses, military outfits. So the idea is like you can check more than your clothes, you know, oh. um, come as you aren't or as you wish you would be. Um, and I looked at my sort of like purple paisley, gay is good clothes and ditched them and got into a, you know, scratchy prom dress. And I went inside and um, there, there were women that were performing strip shows for other women. There were kissing booths. It was a highly sexualized atmosphere. And everybody was, there was a total blurring between who's the audience and who's the performer. And I developed this like collective crush on this group of people who at that point, which was the WOW Cafe, and at that point I, I thought um, I'm just, I just want to do whatever they're doing. I want to be part of this uh, this group of women. And if they'd been doing like um, you know volleyball, I would be a volleyball player. Um, um, at, but at that point, they were having fabulous parties, like the you know the party to end all wars, a military drag party, which realized that we were all pacifists. But there were certain fabulous things about the military, like uniforms and having physicals that we didn't want to get rid of. <laughs> And you would come to this party and you could like go into this like little booth and get examined. Um, and every once in a while this, this really butch number would, you know, like yell at us. It was so thrilling. And make us drop to the floor and give her 25 of anything. I didn't know what that meant, but I just was, I was so happy to give her 25 of anything I had. And, um, so it was this satirical, strange, out of the way place that was really out of, off of any map. There was no sign on the door. Um, and I started hanging out there. And I started doing theater because that's what they did. They didn't do volleyball. They didn't run a food co-op. Um, they, they were doing theater. So it just, it was, I, it was peer pressure, really. What was your first performance experience at the WOW Cafe? I, I did a piece called My Life is a Glamour Don't, and <laughs> where I, I got friends of mine to dress up in their, um, uh, and write little pieces about various fashion mistakes. I, there's a sort of thread through here. It's a thread. Um, <laughs> And uh, so um, that was the first piece I did. And then I did this evening. Um, it was really long. In fact, I think it's still going on, possibly, um, <laughs> called Shrimp in a Basket, which brought up my concern for personal narrative and seafood. Um, uh, and it was a collection of a lot, everything I'd ever written. I staged everything that I had written 
um, not knowing what staging meant or anything like that, but one of, one of the parts of it was this show, The Well of Horniness, which I had written um, as actually as a screenplay for a possible feminist porn video. And um, unfortunately, um, the producer was my only contact I think I've ever had with someone who calls themselves a producer, felt that it wasn't pornographic enough, that women didn't get horny. So um, I, I, I turned to performance art when I couldn't cut the mustard as a, as a pornographer. <laughs> well, it's kind of a... So how do you define performance art? <sighs> Besides failed pornography? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Which may be the, the one definition that, that sticks. I, you know, I didn't really think of myself as a performance artist, um, even, when, even when I had failed as a pornographer. Um, then for a while I thought I was doing theater. Um, uh, and even though I really didn't go to see very much theater. But I thought what I was doing um, was theater. But the more I became aware of what was happening under the term theater in America, um, the more that I saw that it was, um, you know, the, the way that uh, American theater was wedded to realism um, and uh, a certain kind of narrative shape that I really couldn't relate to. And this term performance art was floating around and became the sort of useful place where people who um, people who wanted sort of resisting codification of art forms for various reasons could sort of gather under this leaky umbrella of performance art. Um, it's kind of the garage band of, um, of art forms in a sense. There's, there's um, people who have resisted um, defining what performance art is are people who call themselves performance artists. And it's been people a lot of times who have wanted to work with artists of different disciplines. Sometimes they've wanted to break out of realism. They wanted to work in different ways than American theater, which is a highly codified art form function. So it's, um, it's a very sort of amorphous space. It kind of functions like a cultural wetlands. <laughs> Whatever that means. And uh, what for you has been the relationship between writing and performing? You mentioned you'd had all these things written. Which, the chicken or the egg, you know? <laughs> um, usually it's, a, uh, it's better to um, write something before you perform it, but um, <laughs> sometimes that hasn't happened for me. Um, Well, I really um, thought that I started out thinking that, okay, if I'm anything in this world, I'm, I'm a writer. Um, and uh, I got very excited about that. And then I, I started to, to um, the ham in me could not be denied. Um, and uh, every, every once in a while, I think, no, no, my strength is in writing. But one of the things that's so great about performance art is there's not this sort of sense of compartmentalizing in, in, in there is in um, a lot of theater where the roles are really um, strictly defined. But I did a piece, my first solo, World Without End, um, in response to my mother dying and a way of sort of thinking through my relationship to her. And I realized I couldn't, um, I couldn't really ask anyone else to do this. Um, and I had some need to eulogize her. So the ham got trotted out again. And that's, that's kind of how it happened. Was that the first time you used sort of a very personal story in your work, or has that been something? I think that that was, that was the first time that it was not totally metaphorical or, or extremely campy. I, a play I had written before that had a character in it called Michigan, and um, um, 
so I was thinking, I was thinking more metaphorically, but, but um, World Without End was, was directly autobiographical. So I think of it as like new and improved autobiography. Um, <laughs> that, you know, I mean, you're not limited by the objective facts, you know, to get to the deeper truth um, or to get back at people um, uh, in the service of the larger truth and larger artistic goal. So we've heard a little bit about your work. I would love for our studio audience and for people watching this to get a sense of maybe what your work is like or maybe if you'd want to share a little bit with us. Oh, I'd be happy to. Excellent. Why don't I read something from um, a solo of mine called Clit Notes. The first time I was in love with another woman, well, actually, <laughs> she was the woman. I was a kid. I was 13. In fact, this little, this little story would have a much happier ending if um, there had been some sort of gay youth organization in my hometown, some sort of North American woman-girl love association, but no. <laughs> the men get everything good. <laughs> the lesbian chicken, who worries about them? Her name, oh, this is a very important part of the attraction. Her name was Anita Went, which I discovered sounded an awful lot like I need a whip <laughs> if you said enough times to yourself late at night, and I did. <laughs> she was a social studies teacher, which uh, that's what they called history in my hometown of Saginaw, Michigan. I, I, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that, and I've already told you you that Saginaw is the Navy bean capital of the world and you may have also heard of it in that Simon and Garfunkel song it took us three days to hitchhike from Saginaw if they had connections but what um, <laughs> what they taught us in Michigan was not actually history there are there's laws against teaching history in Michigan so what they teach you instead is amnesia so <laughs> By the time I was 13, all I knew about, say, World War II, I had, uh, I had gleaned from um, Hogan's Heroes, a <laughs> funny little war. Um, I knew that there were slaves at one time in America, and uh, the Republicans freed them. Now, there were forbidden books in my hometown. In fact, I think most books were forbidden. They were, they were there on the library shelves, but you had to get a special note from home to check them out. <laughs> I was not going to get a note from my home to read a book. Um, my mother, my mother used to drop us off at Republican headquarters to uh, stuff envelopes for Nixon, uh, even when he wasn't running. It, it was kind of, <laughs> it was kind of her idea of daycare, uh, keep hope alive. And um, Anita went like slid me these these forbidden books, books like the autobiography of Malcolm X, I'm okay, you're okay, Jonathan Livingston Seagull, and um, I don't know, this made me love her. So this love had this really unfortunate way of expressing itself. Sometimes I'd be, I'd be, um, I'd be in the eighth grade, and I'd be in class, and I'd think, oh, God. Oh, my God. I am going to kiss her. I am going to kiss her, and there is nothing anybody can do to stop me. So I just throw myself to the ground. And I'd start writhing around, hoping people think I was merely epileptic. It's just a little foaming at the mouth is better than having people think you're queer. And um, sometimes I would be so inspired by her lectures that I'd start, I'd start taking my clothes off in class. <laughs> I, um, I once I took my pantyhose off in class. I don't have any memory of taking them off, but then there they were down on the floor in an incriminating taupe heap. And I thought, you know, something is the matter with me. I mean, if I don't, if I don't do something about this, I don't know, I'm going to end up a, a Democrat or something. So <laughs> I went to the most uh, important sexual authority of that time, um, and well, maybe all time, Dr. David Rubens, everything you always wanted to know about sex but were afraid to ask. And I'll tell you, just, I mean, the, the table of contents was an eye opener. I noticed that um, male homosexuals had their own chapter, but the females were just a, a footnote under prostitution. 
Uh, so I just read the whole damn thing, and up to this time, I think, I guess I was naive. I thought that homosexuality had had something to do with, you know, attraction between two people of the same sex, but not according to David Rubin. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> not according to David Rubin. According to David Rubin, the, um, uh, the, the, um, the most important part of the homosexual experience, male or female, is their compulsive erotic relationship to household appliances. This is not fiction. And all that dis uh, distinguishes the male from the female is that male homosexuals are forever shoving various appliances up their ass, you know, shot glasses, blenders, toaster ovens. <laughs> and the lesbians are always strapping them on, um, you know, electric toothbrushes, color TVs, washer dryers. <laughs> Ladies, start your engines. Well. So I'm 13 years old, and it, I don't know, it seems like a very shallow and materialistic form of love. And um, <laughs> I noticed, I thought that being a homosexual, uh, if you wanted to be any good at it, would, would, would take a lot of um, leisure time, not, not to mention electrical outlets. And, <laughs> you know, it was a little hard on the environment, so I read on. And, and Dr. Rubin said that, um, like cancer, impending lesbianism, had its warning signs, and the most ominous of which was, and I quote, the enlarged clitoris of the lesbian, which could be inserted into the vagina of her partner, achieving a reasonable facsimile of oh, the real thing. <laughs> Whatever that is. So I read on, and um, Dr. Rubin said that, quote, the most prized lesbians, and I thought, Wait a minute. Stop the buses. I had no idea there were going to be prizes. Oh my God! Here I am. I'm in the Midwest. I'm in county fair country, and all of a sudden I can see the next Saginaw County Fair. I mean, I, there's the lesbian barn. I mean, I don't know how I missed it. It was there all along, right next to the Holsteins. Just down from down from the Clydesdales. And I, I could I could see all the people. Uh, out on the midway saying, come on down at four, they'll be judging the lesbians, you don't want to miss that. <laughs> and I, I could see in my mind all the like 4-H kids leading around all those, those lesbians they'd hand raised, you know, suckled from, from, from baby butch all the way up to full-blown bulldaggers. <laughs> um, David Rubin didn't say what kind of prizes you could hope to win for being a lesbian, but I, 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 I don't know. I thought a few surge protectors might come in handy. <laughs> and he said, he said that um, some of the most uh, prize-winning specimens had clits four, five, even six inches, I don't know, long, I guess. He didn't really say, but I think you know what I did. I went to, I, uh, I went to my father's workroom. I got his tape measure. It was 25 feet long. You got to believe in yourself. Don't forget that. <laughs> I figured that ought to do it. <laughs> I got my mother's hand mirror. I went to my bedroom. I pulled up my skirt and I ran into all sorts of problems because I couldn't find anything between my legs that looked like it could be inserted into the body of another person, no matter how large it got. And I thought, I began to doubt the very existence of my clitoris. I mean, it it didn't seem like something someone in my family would have. <laughs> Not after all that, that work for Nixon. Um, it didn't really seem like something someone in Saginaw, Michigan would have, or maybe they had them that Simon and Garfunkel took them with them when they <laughs> left. So I just measured everything between my navel and my knees. I took the best score, but nothing was even six inches long. And I knew right then that, you know, I'd, I'd never win any prizes for being a lesbian. Maybe, maybe, I, maybe I wasn't a dyke after all. I just didn't measure up. So that's a little excerpt from Thank you the solo. so much, Holly. <laughs> <laughs> Take a good sip of water after that one. <laughs> so I think that it's become a little bit obvious to um, everyone that you <laughs> use humor quite a lot in your work. What do you mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> I know also um, 
do you, has that always been something that's come naturally to you? And, or is that part something you got from the women at the WOW Cafe? There were a lot of things I got from them, including a moldy BLT that's in my purse over there that's <laughs> stinking up this whole place. But um, um, I think that um, I was a, I was such a strange child, uh, mostly then that, that I was just literate. <laughs> um, um, and um, the, the, the theory of evolution made sense to me that, um, and I didn't have a gender, I was kind of like cousin it on the Adams family. Oh, that's going to translate well into <laughs> Poland, um, China, and India. But if they don't know what cousin it is, it's time they learned. Um, so my one way of coping was um, by um, by making jokes. Um, so that was that was a, um, and I think it was also had to do with being um, a one, the first generation to grow up with television and being really inspired by really terrible TV shows like Gilligan's Island, Adam's Family. These shows were, you know, people and the other American artists talk about. Jackson Pollock, they talk about waiting for Godot, and you know, I see Gilligan's Island and Adam's family very much as sort of my waiting for Godot as my Jackson Pollock. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I see that now. Do you um, see that? And um, how has your work been received by different audiences? I mean, I know in the bio I read, we've listed all the places you've been performed or been produced. Um, any memorable particular times you've been performing? I think that a lot of my work, um, I, I see my work in conversation. Um, even when it's solo, it's, it's imagined as a conversation. And it's a conversation that I wouldn't have begun, begun if um, I hadn't been part of the WOW Cafe, if I hadn't been part of this tiny little world that seemed like what I was thinking about, what was funny to me, what was political to me, was going to be understood. And people would challenge me, and there'd be work there that I would respond to. Um, I also, every, one thing that unified people at WOW is that we had a, somewhat of a critique of feminism as we were experiencing it um, in New York in the early 80s. And Part of it had to do with sexuality and our desire to sort of place sexuality at the center of feminist discourse. Um, um, part of it had to do with style, um, about um, in some ways borrowing and building from a sort of campy tradition that a lot of gay men had pioneered. Um, rather than um, a more earnest style that had been typical of other feminist art projects. Um, so I saw my work also in conversation and pieces like World Without End, Click Notes, in conversation uh, with um, other feminists. I mean, I, I think that a lot of times um, there's a sort of feeling that um, if you're, you're speaking from a sub, uh, 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 stigmatized subject position, and if you can't speak at all um, from a, sub, uh, a, a stigmatized subject position, that your work should be addressing um, a mainstream audience. In other words, if I can't convince Jesse Helms, um, you know, that gay people shouldn't be, um, I don't know, rounded up and branded, um, then somehow I'm not doing my work. Um, so I imagined it in conversation, and I had a lot of disputes with um, feminist and lesbian gay critics um, and saw my artwork as kind of a response to feminist and gay theory as it was being lived out at that time. How do mainstream audiences receive your work? Um, mostly they don't receive it. <laughs> <laughs> Although if you, um, you know, spent $49.99 at my website, they could receive it and you could send me to. Um, no, mostly I don't perform. Uh, I have performed a few times to more mainstream audiences. Um, but I've, I've, I've sort of gone with 
the Kate Clinton idea about the mainstream is that it's shallow and slow moving and it's the tributaries where the action is. Um, um, I think that my work is preaching to the converted. But I, I, and I borrow from that expression which um, David Roman, who is a, is a theorist, uses. Um, and talking about being a progressive person in America as an act of faith. It's really, there's nothing to go on except faith, it's particularly at this moment. Um, and it's a faith that, um, like any kind of spiritual belief, is in danger of being eroded. Um, so there's something active that happens between the audience and myself. We're not necessarily all in agreement, but we're inspiring, challenging each other, um, and reminding ourselves that just because our worldview is not part of commercial culture doesn't mean that our critique's not valid. Huh. Um, in sort of all these different performance experiences, have you had some, have you had any experience with censorship, say? Oh, how many hours do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I hope we have several hours for this. Yes, I have. Censorship is my middle name. Um, at first, my first early experiences with censorship were about my wanting to make work that was about a kind of irreverent um, lesbian sexuality. And just by reclaiming this word, horny, which of course relates to male sexuality, um, I remember having huge fights um, with feminist groups who thought this was just horrible. And um, I had been really inspired by drag theater and wanted, wanted women to have the same opportunities to have big wigs and lots of eye makeup and phony accents. Um, and uh, late at night, it all seemed fabulous to me, what's not to like, and that the, it wasn't incompatible with feminism. So I had various experiences early on where I remember uh, the Well of Horniness was uh, had a long run in Washington, D.C., and uh, on opening night, people's tires were slashed and um, flyers were, were um, you know, uh, destroyed for the show and things like that. Um, and I had other disputes, but I mean, it's more of a sort of a dispute. Um, but in 1990, I was one of the artists um, whose work came under attack by uh, right-wing politicians and had National Endowment for the Arts funding that was awarded to me um, taken away. So that was sort of my induction into, that's when it became my middle name, uh -huh. as opposed to just my hobby. <laughs> <laughs> and um, how long did that um, take to work through? I know it was sort of a process. It was a process. It was, it was quite a process. Um, the uh, initial denial of the grant was in 1990, and um, the sort of last stage of, of that, that chapter uh, was in 1998 when our uh, case was heard by the United States Supreme Court. And along the way, um, there were lots of little victories. Um, we, were, we were contending that the First Amendment applied to government arts funding. Um, and the First Amendment, specifically in this context, says that um, the federal government cannot discriminate in the way they give up funding in a way to suppress unpopular or minority viewpoints. Not that I thought of lesbianism as a viewpoint, but hey, it's, you know, it's better than a lifestyle. I'd rather have a viewpoint. Because um, I see this like woman in a minivan going down the interstate and maybe she sees a sign that says lesbian viewpoint next left. So I'll just go <laughs> with that. Um, um, <laughs> And I'm too sloppy to have a lifestyle, so I have a lesbian <laughs> viewpoint. Um, and so more than the grants that were denied to these other artists at the same time, it, it, it was the principle about whether free speech applied to government art funding. 
And two courts, two federal courts, said yes, it did, and that this was clearly a violation. Along the way, the Clinton administration gave us our funding. Um, but the United States Supreme Court eventually decided that um, that the um, arts, the arts organizations, weren't being compelled to uh, consider decency, which is their code word for no queers, no queers, no queers. Um, uh, when they just don't want to come out and say that, you know, a quicker way to say decency. Um, since since the arts organizations weren't compelled to take that into consideration, then it didn't violate the First Amendment. So um, it, it was a dissatisfying uh, dissatisfying settlement that we came to, and also um, also part of something larger, which was a total uh, total destruction, pretty much, of public arts funding in this country for individual artists and artists from um, outsider groups. Huh. Do you think that your relationship with either the queer community or the feminist community changed as a result of the NEA stuff? It was a very complicated, it, my relationship with pretty much everyone, including a lot of my best friends, were really, was really challenged by this experience because um, uh, so many of, of, of people in the art world, including good friends of mine, really bought into the idea that there's no such thing as bad publicity. And by singling out a handful of artists whose work was frankly provocative and intended to be controversial, um, it, it was easy to see this as a problem of a few artists um, or artists that worked in, uh, in particular topics. Uh, rather than what it really was, which was an attack, first of all, on public funding in the arts, but attack on public funding in general, because this model was used to attack public education, public health, yada, yada, yada. We have public nothing in this country anymore. Um, so I felt that my private experience of it, which was being transformed into a political football, um, having to continually sort of justify my work, and the sort of psychic damage of um, having your work held up for ridicule, um, and including by people in the feminist and queer community, uh, and at the same time getting death threats from the right wing, um, letters like, uh, I know where you live, I have a gun, I'm coming to New York this summer, P.S. Jesus loves you. And I'm like, <laughs> thank you for that P.S. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, that's my favorite death threat. All of that had an enormous traumatizing toll on me. And plus, I felt like we lost. We lost. We lost the big political goal that we were hoping to achieve. Um, so it was a very... It was a very difficult moment. I mean, I would, I would find, in some ways, some solidarity with gay people because my work had been clearly singled out because of homophobia. Um, but at the same time, then I'd hear like critiques in the gay media that, you know, she's not really gay. She talked in that piece about sleeping with a guy, or she's gay but she's not queer. And you know, it's like, oh God, you know, she's got the wrong haircut. Her haircut oppresses me. And um, <laughs> Um, I, so it was a very, it was a very difficult experience and I was caught in this situation where the more I sort of responded to the charges and tried to talk about the issues, the more I think it sort of in, it increased the sense that this was just an individual problem. This was, you know, like Holly, you know, Holly Hughes, mano a mano with Jesse Helms. Um, as opposed to it being a much broader problem. Mm. Um, you know, we want to like individualize and psychologize 
even though I can't say that. Um, <laughs> we want to do it. I can't say it, but we do it anyways. Um, did you, uh, did this affect your work in any way? It did. It, it stopped my work. I mean, I, and put me into a place of, of really standing outside my work and judging it in a way that I don't think is helpful for, for any artist and being afraid. I was afraid. Um, I was just, what was I afraid of? I'm not even sure, but it so echoed um, experiences of shaming and feeling like you were wrong, um, that it, it echoed my own sort of self-doubts and it echoed sort of experiences of growing up feeling completely alienated from um, everyone else in the Navy being capital and from my family and through my political beliefs and, um, and my sexuality, those levels of alienation. So it, it reopened those wounds. And then preaching to the perverted, you wrote after 1998, after the I decision? did, I did. Can you I tell mean, I was struggling for a long time, like how can I take this experience I think of myself as somebody who tries to take personal narrative and turn it into political parables. So, like, it's perfect. It's great material. How can I go wrong? But I couldn't find my way into the story uh, for a long time, partially because I think I was in the story. It was still happening. Um, but then I went to the United States Supreme Court, and I have to say, Mimi, it was the weirdest <laughs> piece of experimental theater that I've ever seen. And I have seen a lot of weird, you know, site-specific theater. And I started describing it to friends of mine, just like the fact that you have to get tickets to go to the Supreme Court. And they're not easy to get, you know. <laughs> it's a long-running hit. And you have to know the right people. And I remember my lawyer saying, you know, like, if you want to go to the hearing, you better let me know right away because tickets are going fast. And so I say, <laughs> can I have two? And he's like, <laughs> I'll see what I can do. And it was um, under the sort of veneer of democracy, it felt like some sort of national detention hall. Um, you went through many, this is pre-9-11, many, many metal detectors. But, but more than that, more than the endless surveillance was the fact that the minute you walked into the foyer of the Supreme Court, two hours before the hearing starts, yards from where the hearing happens, the first rule is no talking. Just don't talk. And so there's all these different lines, and you don't know where the lines are going. Maybe they're going to an outlet mall or Great Adventures <laughs> or, you know, the not-so-Supreme Court. You don't know. <laughs> My lawyer had said to me, make sure you get in the right line. And then it's like, how do you find out what the right line is? <laughs> and so you're, um, so, it, 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 so it's uh, this chaotic, weird feeling as you go into the Supreme Court and then you're escorted to your seats by members of the Secret Service and they seat you in these pews. And I'm not talking about seats that uh, uh, resemble pews, remind you of pews. I'm talking about onward Christian soldiers, faith of our fathers, pew pews. And um, so I'm telling people this and they're just like, because of course the Supreme Court is um, completely invisible. Um, there's no, there's no photography, there's no, none of even those little um, funny court drawings. Um, in fact, the journalists that go to the Supreme Court can't bring any recording equipment and they can't bring pens or paper. Um, so they're out there trying, at, you know, after the hearing, trying to reconstitute it. And I thought, these are people who do not like to be reviewed. <laughs> and on that level, I could really understand and relate to them, <laughs> but I somehow I felt that it was wrong. <laughs> I felt like it was wrong, um, uh, and I wrote the piece. Um, it, it began a way to, for me to talk about my experiences in the culture war and um, to out the Supreme Court, not in the most 
exciting sense of the word out, but um, I felt like to sort of peel back um, and, and show the kind of way this performance was constructed. Oh, you can tell I've been teaching him. This performance has been <laughs> constructed. Well, that's just a wonderful segue into my next question. <laughs> yeah, I was really, um, being a former student of yours and um, really and having enjoyed your teaching, uh -huh. I, wanted, I wanted to know a little bit about hey. how you got into teaching. Um, well, it was, it was another accident. Karen Finley didn't show up one day. That's really <laughs> true. <laughs> Karen Finley didn't show up at NYU, and they called me, and I was like, I was a, it was a slow time in the performance art days. It was, I was um, between gigs, and I was like, sure, and then I thought, like, I have no idea. <laughs> and it was at uh, New York University's Experimental Theater Wing, which is a wonderful program, and I was like, oh my God, I don't know, I, I have no idea what I'm going to do. And this friend of mine who had gone there said, it's, you know, experimental theater. You can tell them to run around Washington Square Park and do push-ups afterwards, and they'll do it. And um, I got a suggestion from uh, my friend and, and former NEA4 co-defendant Tim Miller um, about self-scripting, where it's just like, have people talk for a minute, do a story about what happened to them the day before. And out of that one, uh, that one exercise, we did a whole semester of work. The students were great. They were really wonderful. Um, I, I thought at that moment that that's what was going to be, you know, I could feel the love and these, the students were really interested in the idea of taking their own experience and shaping it into performance and um, really generous towards me as a beginning teacher. So. That was my first experience. Have they all been that like that? No, they have not all been like that. <laughs> <laughs> they have not been all like that. I have a, it, it's a, it's a wonderful job when it goes well, but it's, it's, um, and 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 it's it's very exciting. And then when it's not going well, it feels like. It it feels like some sort of. Um, version of Groundhog's Day, the Bill Murray movie where he's forced to p repeat the same day over and over again, but you're repeating the same comedy act over and over again, and dying, you know, bombing, um, as they say in comedy clubs, in front of the same people. It's just like, you know, every day, um, at, you know, uh, so it's, it's, it's a it's a kind of performance oh. skill, um, or as one of my students in a class I'm currently teaching, I was trying to teach them about metaphors. But I actually think after three weeks, they knew more about metaphors than before I started. I could see them losing knowledge in my presence, which is a very <laughs> depressing feeling as a teacher that they were actually smarter and more open before I started in on them. And so after three weeks of trying to define me metaphors, they're like, so, like, is death a metaphor? And I'm like, no. <laughs> death is a reality. It's a reality I'm having right now <laughs> on a daily basis in front of you. This is what it looks like. So then there is, so then there is a relationship for you between teaching and performing. Yeah, there is. There is. And it's a different, it's a different kind of performance. I mean, it's hard to sustain the 15, you know, after teaching for a long time, I really haven't, I don't have enough material to stretch out um, uh, for 15 weeks. So unless someone else in the class starts doing their act, unless, you know, you trip the switch and other, you know, uh, the circuit gets completed and other people start doing stuff and it becomes a conversation, they have to sit through, you know, my 30-minute routine over and over and over again. I try and do it in different accents, but it's really, um, it is a performance. Um, how did you end up here specifically, teaching? End up? You think this is where I'm going to end up? <laughs> how, did you come, how did you come to Michigan again? Um, I make that joke because I'm, um, a lot of my early work, um, I don't know, the narrative arc, if there was anything in, um, in, in the work, was 
well, maybe I really didn't change the world or do all I set out to accomplish, but at least I got out of Michigan. And then, like, <laughs> <laughs> I walk down streets here in Ann Arbor that smell like my childhood. And um, I see my mother's hair walking down the street, you know, and someone else's head. And um, I came to Michigan um, after having supported myself, being very fortunate, very privileged for 15 years to be able to work independently, to tour, to do some teaching, um, but really be self-employed, and that was and, and really travel all over the country and 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 some some places abroad, doing my work. Um, and then I noticed my teeth were starting to fall out, um, and I noticed I didn't have any insurance. Um, <laughs> and um, I thought, and and I had I didn't have any skills, um, <laughs> and that I was also getting old, and it was late to get skills, and so. Um, I thought that the possibly the only thing I could do was possibly get a teaching job, maybe. But performance arts, such a you know, it's it's just. It's this weird, as I've described it, this brat art form that, you know, you, you can sort of see like theater and art and design tossing it back and forth. No, you take it. No, you take it. You take it. It's yours. It's yours. It's yours. <laughs> um, you know, I, I lived in a neighborhood in New York like that. Neither Brooklyn or Queens wanted this neighborhood. They'd be like, you know, we got getting kicked out of different boroughs. No, you have it. No, it's part of Queens. No, we don't want it. Um, so, uh, I, I got invited to be here as a, a visiting artist a couple of years ago, and um, it, I, I don't know, maybe it's more evidence of the decline of higher education, um, <laughs> but here I am. Wonderful. <laughs> um, and so you have this joint appointment between uh -huh. art and theater. Uh -huh. um, how do you feel being in the art department specifically? It's good. How do I feel about it? Well, I feel like art has somehow remained more elastic mm -hmm. in its definitions um, than perhaps theater has been, um, where theater, particularly in this country, has um, not embraced as much um, some new technologies, um, new sort of um, approaches to narrative, whereas art and design is continually like, oh yeah, digital art, come on down, you know, um, uh, you know, new media, robots, you know, conceptual art, come on down, you know, sit, sit down here next to painting, yeah, you guys will get along, um, <laughs> and um, it, it's. Um, Performance art, um, as a term, really came out of the art world and came out of people doing work in galleries. And it, it, it borrows from a lot of different aesthetic and political traditions, but that's mm -hmm. one, um, one of the places. Yeah, that's neat. Um, I guess we're getting to the end of our question section, but I did want to ask um, if you'd want to share, perhaps, you one or two of the most memorable moments in your life. Oh, the most memorable moments in my life. You've already told us about the Supreme Court. That I seems told us quite about the memorable. Supreme Court. I told you about taking my pantyhose off in the eighth grade during. <laughs> I think we were learning about how a bill becomes a law. That was significant. <laughs> um, let's see. I, I told you about my failure to educate students about what a metaphor was. What were some other significant um, moments. Um, well, I, one thing that I love being able to do um, at Michigan um, and, and that I can only do within the framework of an institution is um, collaborating with a large group of people, um, making a piece of theater, for lack of a better word. Um, and I, did, I had the opportunity to do that last winter. Um, with a group of uh, 25 students here at the University of Michigan. And um, uh, we made this piece after a fashion, and um, 
I think that I said something at the time that it was about clothing and identity and how, you know, does, does consumerism shape identity or the other way around. But really it was a show about shopping. And <laughs> um, but that does sound better. That if I, doesn't it sound better if I say it's about consumerism and identity? Yeah, it sounds, <laughs> sounds much more on the level of the I university. Take it. Yeah, you would take it. You would go to that. <laughs> Um, and it, it was a, it was a wonderful experience to work with a group of students from uh, different parts of the university had different ways of working. You build this community. The aesthetic product you make is only as good as the community is. And then we had the fabulous um, opportunity of taking it to New York and performing at the Guggenheim Museum last. Um, last fall and that was just a great experience. So you haven't really left New York? No, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did want to ask um, if there's anything in your life that you could change, what would it be? All of it. Yeah, no, um, I'd be much taller. Um, <laughs> I relate. You, would you be t I would be taller. Um, I know that the way you're supposed to answer that question is no. No. <laughs> change it but, you know, God damn it. Um, <laughs> hello, rest of the world. Um, uh, yeah, I, probably everything. Um, let's see, where would I start? Um, uh, yeah, taller would be good. Um, um, you know, I would have um, I, I would have flossed my teeth more. Um, you know, I really thought that that wasn't important. I, I turned out to be right. That's really important, flossing. Um, um, I think, I, 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 yeah, there, there are decisions I would have made differently. But, but then maybe I wouldn't be sitting here with you. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and clearly, this is where you're supposed to be, yes. sitting here with me. Um, I did want to ask you a question in closing that um, we do try to ask everyone who's interviewed mm -hmm. for this project. Um, you've talked a lot about sort of your changing relationship with feminism over the years. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, how would you define feminism for yourself or how you've experienced it? Right. Well, I think that um, unfortunately the sort of really to me, simple premise of feminism uh, that um, that uh, women t uh, deserve equal rights um, with men, um, that our gender system has a sort of inherent discrimination in it. That 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 that, that premise seems still outlandish and difficult to put into practice. Um, virtually everywhere. Um, even as feminism has become, you know, really a, a denigrated word. Um, a lot of my students don't want to identify as, as feminists. Um, and especially when they when they find that I'm one. We don't want to end up like her. We floss. We're not that's not gonna happen to us. Um, that uh, so I think that the the idea is that that any of uh, feminism is, and any political philosophy, continually changing. The political landscape is changing. It, I speak about a condition of being here in the Midwest as a middle class white lesbian. Um, and it's a very different experience in another part of the world, in another part of the city with a different class background. And we have to keep changing. We have to keep changing. Um, our strategies, the goals keep sh shifting. Thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to add that we haven't covered? I hope we're going to get rid of George Bush. That's, that's <laughs> you know, and I'd like everyone that's watching, hopefully when they watch this video, George Bush will be gone. And um, otherwise, I just can imagine the audiences in other countries just like going, why should I listen to any of these uh, people in America who are just like single-handedly destroying the world. But um, I don't know if that was really a comment so much as a, or a sort of a nervous tick. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> um, I would like to turn this over to you now. Um, we have a great audience with us today. So if you would like to take questions from them, we'd I'll, love to hear some. 
I'll entertain, though not necessarily answer all questions. <laughs> Bring it on, as they say here. Who's first? Grill me, probe me. Um, well, I have, I have just a quick one. Um, you, uh, you mentioned your uh, solo work as being sort of uh, a conversation, sort of, you know, with the audience, with uh -huh. other feminists and things like that. Um, and you also mentioned uh, the work that you've done um, with students. Um, do you sort of think of that as kind of a similar type of, of conversation, or does it function differently, or what do you sort of gain from that um, for yourself? Or? Well, you know, I first I just want to point out you sat down. So uh, do you... Uh, I was just going to point out that you needed to tuck in your shirt. <laughs> That's part of the conversation. <laughs> I do think of it as a, what was the question? I was, I was so distracted by, otherwise I think your outfit is really nice. But um, <laughs> is there, what is the question? <laughs> I don't know. What do you get out of of, of doing um, doing work that's kind of different people's narratives and conversation, or sort of what do you enjoy most about that? Um, well, a couple of different things. One, um, it's as narcissistic as I am, and I think it's one of my best characteristics. Um, I'm at this point even a little bit bored with myself. So putting on the hip boots and wading around in someone else's trauma um, is, is a relief. And uh, I also um, love to see those moments where, when people real I mean, this is going to like, this is like really going to sound like, it's not even like um, sappy lesbian feminism. It's like, it's like coffee table feminism, but I really believe it. Isn't that sad? But that people have, uh, that everyone has a story, that they have, that, that narratives that matter, that connect to larger merit narratives, and those moments when people make those connections, um, whether or not they break into the glamorous and fast-paced world of performance art after that, um, and are able to land a waitress job as a result of that. Um, and at the risk of sounding totally corny, that maybe it's a moment of empowering, uh, a moment of sort of, um, of particularly working with sometimes with young people who, you know, there's there's still sort of evolving a sense of self, and that that can be a, a critical moment of when somebody you know, start, feels like they don't have anything to talk about, and then, you know, they start talking about um, that uh, everybody in their family um, was obsessed with alien abductions, and they would spend their, 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 their weekends driving around meeting other uh, alien abductees. Everybody except the pers this one person in the family. The, the aliens came for everyone but her. And the moment that she realizes is it's not just like a trauma that she has to, you know, the little green men did not want me. <laughs> that she realizes that that's a story. Um, that there's something she could do with that is, is a wonderful moment. And if she doesn't do something with it, then, then I have to kill her. And, you know, then the <laughs> alien abduction story becomes mine. <laughs>